right, well, we have a full house. Um, I'm going to try to project my voice, but let me know if you can't hear me in the back. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, how many of you guys have been hearing a lot of Katy dids and cicadas lately? All right, so we know that those guys are producing a lot of sound and they're communicating with each other through sound. And we usually think of sound and insects as these crickets and katydids and cicadas, but we're going to talk a about a different type of sound that we actually can't hear with our own ears. We have to ta tap into the plant stems to hear. So this is stuff that most people in the world have never heard before. Um, before I start in on that, I'm just going to give you guys kind of a quick rundown on what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what sound is, because it's probably not what you guys think it is. It's a little bit more than what you guys are thinking about. I'm going to talk a little bit about bioacoustic prospecting. Uh, we're going to play a little game in terms of guessing, guessing the sound I play, see if you guys can figure out um, what's producing that sound. Um, we're gonna, I'll give you a little bit of a brief introduction to research that we do in our lab on these insects called tree hoppers. And then each of my lab members who came, came uh, with me is going to give you guys a little snippet of the type of research they do. And we've got one brand new lab member who actually doesn't, hasn't yet really worked much on insects, so he's going to talk about um, marine animals. So that's going to be a, an extra special little treat. Um, and then hopefully there'll be time at the end that you guys can come and chat with us and we can show you some of the equipment that we, we brought here. All right, so what is sound? Does anyone think that they have a good idea of what sound might be? Yeah. Vibrations in the air. Excellent. So sound is definitely vibrations, and sound can travel through the air. Did you have something you wanted to add? Um, sound, um, sound waves. Yep. Can, um, and vibrations are a very good carrier of sound. Yeah, perfect. So sound, sound travels in waves and vibrations through the air and we think about birds singing and the cicadas and katydids that are out right now, but sound actually travels through more than just air. Sound can travel through water, so if you think about whales singing, that is sound that's traveling through water, not air. It can travel as surface vibrations, so a lot of little water bugs will create vibrations on the surface of water and that's how they kind of sing to each other. And Sound can travel through the ground and other substrates like stems, um, like this elephant that calls long distances through the ground. So sound really takes a bunch of different forms, and it's more than just what we hear with our ears. It's what we could hear underwater, what we could feel on the surface of, of the water, and what we can listen to when we tap into the ground or, or into plants. So we're going to focus mostly on substrate-borne vibrations today, so I'll probably just refer to them as vibrations. Um, and we're going to talk about ones that travel through plant stems. So these two are the tree hoppers that we study. Um, and these guys um, sing through vibrations that travel through the plant stem. So if you think about having two tin cans and a string between them, and you can put the tin can up to your ear and you can talk pretty far, Someone could be across the room and you could whisper and they could hear it because that sound is traveling through that string. It's very similar with these insects, they create sounds that travel through the stem. So I have a little uh, cartoon to show you guys what this will look like. This guy will call, it'll vibrate through the stem. If he's lucky, someone will call back. And this is the type of sound that you hear when that happens. So this is something that you guys are probably one of like maybe 500 people in the world that has heard this type of sound. You can't hear it with your ears. We use lasers and other equipment that I'll talk a little bit more about um, soon. And what you guys actually heard was these two are duetting with one another. The male is calling, ooh, and the female likes what she hears and she, so she goes, mmm. <laughs> so I'll play that one more time for you guys. Whoops. I don't know how. Oh, I have to find it up here, do I? Okay, so we, you guys might be thinking, well, this is really unusual. Like, how many other insects do this type of thing? 
Well, it turns out that over 90% of insects that sing are making substrate-borne vibrations, sounds that we cannot hear with our ears because they don't travel through the air. Um, and they either produce, that's the only type of sound they produce, or they might produce both sound that travels through the air and the plant stems. But this is the major way that insects sing to one another. So you go out tonight and listen to what you hear, that's only 10%, 10% of the sounds that insects are making. We just don't have the sensory system to be able to process those. And it's not just insects, it's so many different animals are doing that. So I'm gonna play you guys a video. This is a wolf spider um, that I studied during my PhD. <laughs> and guess what? These guys sing too. They produce vibrations that travel through the ground. So I'm gonna show you this male. He's going to be doing a little dance and singing a little song. How is it doing that? There we go. So he's waving his big ornamented legs and he's making these um, vibrations that the females are picking up with their, their legs to listen in on what he has to say. Now I mentioned that it's not just insects, we hear spiders doing it, elephants produce sounds that travel through um, the ground, they produce alarm calls if there's a predator nearby, and they actually pick up these vibrations in their feet and their trunks. You have mole rats that do this, they actually butt their head on the ground to create taps in order to communicate with other mole rats. You even have frogs that do this. They hit, you know, frogs inflate their vocal sac when they're singing and the sac will hit the ground and that actually has, it uh, causes a percussive sound. And then I mentioned the wolf spiders but also jumping spiders. This is kind of a newly famous peacock spider. I'd recommend looking up videos of all of these things um, on the web. All right, so why, why do you guys think that these guys are producing substrate-borne sound? Why not through the air? <clears throat> Someone other than these two have a guess? Yeah. Uh, so something else can't find them? Okay, so one leading hypothesis is that, well, if they sing through the ground, maybe predators can't hear them. And that's what a lot of people thought until recently when we realized that almost everything can actually pick up these vibrations. And so it's not actually the private channel that we thought it was. But that is, that is something that a lot of people used to think. In the back? Uh, spiders don't have ears. Yeah, so they don't have ears, absolutely. And ears are a major, what we call a major evolutionary innovation. It's a new organ that we had to, over time, evolved that specialized to picking up airborne sound. Substrate-borne sound is much easier in order to be able to, to detect because it, it requires what's called mechanosensation, the ability to feel um, vibrations and uh, mechanical pressure on your body. And we need mechanosensation to determine um, the direction of gravity, for balance, for detecting air um, particle motion. So already most organisms are able to use mechanosensation and that's much easier to adapt that to hear sound than it is to um, evolve ears, um, you know, de, de novo as a new evolutionary adaptation. All right, so here we are in the field listening for insect calls. We are what is called bioacoustic prospecting. And when we do this, we basically clip into plants and we just listen to see what we, what we can hear. Um, so we do a lot of this, which I would not recommend doing in Missouri right now because it's been unbelievably hot. Um, but basically we sit around and listen, and this is an accelerometer. So an accelerometer is a very sensitive piece of equipment that can detect really, really, really tiny vibrations. Um, actually, in fact, our phones have accelerometers. That's how your phone knows which direction um, you're holding it, why the screen flips. We use lasers. So this laser is pointing at leaf litter. Uh, this is another picture of the accelerometer. You can even use phonograph needles, so record needles. How many people, how many of the young people in this crowd have ever seen a record player? 
All right, how many people overall have seen a record player? All right, so most of you guys, that's comforting. Um, so you can actually take the needle that, that you, uh, you use to play your records and you can place that on a plant and it's really sensitive. It's gonna pick up the vibrations of the plant, much like it picks up the, the um, you know, surface of the, the record. Um, and then you can also use guitar clips and little mini amps. So we have one here. Um, is it on? So basically what Doan did is she took this little guitar clip and she just clipped it right onto the plant. It's not on. Try to. It's really dull. It's, yeah, it's too quiet. Anyway, so that's how we listen to it. And when you, if you guys come up later, we can show you a little bit more about how that happens. So when you, do, when you go bioacoustic prospect and you hear some really cool stuff, so I'm going to play you guys a few of those sounds. So this is an insect walking. So that's how sensitive this equipment is, as it can hear an insect walking on a stem. That's pretty incredible, right? And I'm gonna play you a few more sounds, and a lot of these, we literally laugh out loud when we hear them, because it's really hard to imagine anything making these types of sounds. your ears. So these are um, these are all insects that are calling to it to one another for some reason. So sometimes it's an insect that's saying it's this is my plant. I'm here and I'm defending it. Sometimes it's I'm looking for another individual to interact with. Is anyone else out there? A lot of this we don't know. A lot of people pretty much no one in the world has ever listened to this stuff before. Um, I'm going to show you a video of this. Um, so watch this insect's abdomen right here start to move um, and it'll start singing. <laughs> Alright, so these these calls are pretty cool, right? Can we all agree with that? Yeah. Pretty neat. They're so neat, in fact, that a really famous sound artist wanted to work with us on a sound installation. And so we went out and we recorded a bunch of these and he made it into a sound installation that we played back. This is called the Cube. There are 128 speakers in this four-story um, thing. And he, he composed the piece entirely of insect songs that we can only hear through the substrate. And there was one that we really tried to get him to put in the presentation and he refused to do it because he said no one will believe it's an insect. So I, I certify that this is an insect. <laughs> He was pretty sure that there was one of those tip over moo cows and someone was playing a trick on us. <laughs> All right, so I, I have a little game. It's going to be guess that vibra guess this vibration and I have to put a picture of my dog in there because he's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so you guys ready? I'm going to give you guys a couple of examples. Um, of, of the types of questions I'm going to ask you guys, and then I'm going to have you guys vote on, on some of these. All right, so what I'll do is I'll play a sound. 
I gave it away. <laughs> some of these are not playing for some reason. All right, so I might play you something like that. And then you have to guess what it is. And in that case, it was these ants that were attacking our accelerometer. They did not want our recording device on their plant. I might ask you, um, actually, I will ask you whether you think that this next sound is a synthesizer or an insect. All right, what do you guys think? How many people vote synthesizer? <laughs> All right, a few, guys, a few of you guys think I'm trying to trick you here. It is actually um, these little insects that you find on black locusts. Um, these little guys right here. All right, this next one I'm hoping, I think a lot of you guys will get this. And hopefully it's not super, super loud. All right, what do you guys think? Dog. <laughs> a frog. You guys think that's a dog? Are you guys being silly? It's not a dog. Yes, it's a bee. It's a bee as the flowers would hear it. What's that? I have something after that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Everybody knows that honeybee pollinates your, your veggies and your flowers and yeah. your fruit trees. Absolutely. Did you know the carpenter bee can pollinate just by the fluttering of its wings? The sound of the carpenter bee's wings pollinates the plant. So that's another great way that insects are using sound is to pollinate flowers. Yeah, the carpenter bee only. Okay, great. That is a new piece of knowledge for me. Yeah. All right. I think you guys, you guys, there's a pretty good chance you guys are going to get this. Waterfall. Very, very, very close. It is, it is water falling. It is rain. Absolutely. Great. He's got a good ear. Do you camp? Because that's what I think of when I'm in my tent. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> All right, what it, what's that? That's a person. Yeah. That was a trick one. It was. So this is so plants actually pick up airborne sound. So if you're talking next to the plant, the equipment can pick up those vibrations on the plant itself. So sometimes that's how we test if it's working properly. We'll talk and see if it picks up our, our voice. All right, now we've got a dog question here. Is this, is this my dog happy that I'm home and giving a room? Or is this an unknown insect? Do I just wait? What do you guys think? Yes! I thought I was going to trick you guys. Yeah, it was an insect. What insect was it? We don't know. We don't know what insect it is. Alright, here's another is this a dog or is this an insect question. You guys ready? It might be a little quiet, so you might want to be really, really, really quiet. Okay. What are you guys saying? Yes, it was a dog. That was actually a car driving by and the dog was barking out the window. It wasn't my dog, but it was another dog. Okay, now I've got two sounds to play you guys. And I, got, I want you guys to determine whether you think it's a stink bug and which one is a, do you guys know what kind of bug this is? A beetle. It's a Japanese beetle. So, I've got a recording of a stink bug and a recording of a Japanese beetle, and I want you guys to 
to decide which is which. All right, so you guys are gonna have to be quiet again because it might be really, really quiet. Ready? So that's one. You all play it again. Okay. You guys ready for the second one? All right. Which which is number one? Does anyone think number one is the stink bug? Everyone who raised their hand thinking number one was a stink bug is right. So I'll play them again. All right, so this is the stink bug. <laughs> and, and here is the Japanese beetle. So it's pretty cool, we can't hear that, right? So we see they might be doing this right in front of our eyes and we have no idea that they're making these sounds. All right, oh yeah. So I've got another one, and I've got a video that's attached to this one, so I want you guys to think about what kind of insect this might be. Cricket. Any guesses? Okay, we've got a cricket. What do you guys think? Me? I think it's the bug um, cleaning itself. Okay, maybe it, it sounds like it's scrubbing, doesn't it? <coughs> You think it's a fly? Any other guesses? A ladybug? What do you guys think? All right, so let's see. I'm going to play the video. So it's this guy right here. Yeah? It's an ant, and in fact, it's an ant that is upset that we have a recording device on its plant. <laughs> so it is squeaking so that its, its colony mates can come and help defend the plant from our intrusive piece of equipment. All right, so the main thing that we actually work on our in, a, in our lab is this one very special insect called a tree hopper. And these are tree hoppers, and these are all over Missouri. So you have tree hoppers that are on the red bud trees. You have tree hoppers that are on wafer ash, on bittersweet. But a lot of people don't even ever notice them. They kind of blend in. They look a little bit like thorns. And these guys use substrate-borne vibrations to sing to one another. So they do have a head. I'll show you, actually. It is hard to imagine. So their eye is here, and these are its uh, legs. It's got its wings folded up, and then it has this horn on its head that we call a pronotum. Can you guys say that, pronotum? pronotum. And you know what? It looks really silly, right? We have no idea why they have it. That is a mystery that science has not yet solved. All right, so these guys live in this wafer ash tree. This is over at Shaw Nature Reserve. And these guys are really social little insects. So here they are as nymphs. So they're just still babies right here, and they like to clump together. So here they are again, clumping together. And these guys are molting. So they're shedding their skin, they're shedding their exoskeleton. And when they do that, their skin is really, really soft for a little while, and it's this beautiful green color. And their eyes are these beautiful red spots. And so you can tell when you look at the plant, when you see these little ghost-like um, nymphs, that, that they just molted in the last day. So here's another picture of the nymphs. They have these little spiky things on their abdomen, and they start to make these, so this is a really small one. You don't see any horn on its head. And this is one that the next time he molts, it's going to be an adult, and it has already started to form this horn on its head. So we keep these guys in our greenhouse. So we keep hundreds of plants, and on these plants we put the tree hoppers. And that's where we keep them so that when we do experiments, we can go into the greenhouse and grab our insects and bring them inside and do controlled experiments with them. Sometimes we need to have them outside when they're adults, and so we make these bags. And so one of the most important pieces of equipment in our lab is a sewing machine. 
which is really kind of funny to think about. So everyone who graduates out of my lab knows how to sew. I don't know if they would sew your clothing super well, but everyone knows how to sew a really good net. Do nymphs, do nymphs uh, make vibrations as well? Nymphs do make vibrations. Um, no one has really studied them very closely, but they make sounds um, when they get attacked. They'll make sounds, um, and then all of them will call at once. And you can actually see like a wave of sound going down the branch. And sometimes they'll make sounds to recruit others to help them feed. So if a bunch are feeding in one area, it's possible that the sap flows faster. So they're using sound. We just haven't studied that as well as, as the adult sounds. All right, so the rest of my lab is going to tell you a little bit about their work, because you guys don't want to listen to me the entire time. Um, so here we are at a lab barbecue, being goofy. Um, Dawn is going to talk a little bit about her project. So she's done a project that is, has gotten us a big grant for the lab so we can do more of this research. So she'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, Noah is, uh, he just finished his sophomore, his second year in college, and he's doing an independent project. And he'll tell you a little bit about that. And Daniel is brand new to our lab. And he's a postdoc. That means he got his PhD. He got his PhD a few years ago, and he's been working on marine animals. And he's going to tell us a bit about them. Do you guys need to get up and stretch before the next little bit? No. Okay. Don't do it then. <laughs> Oops. I thought you were going to put it all together. I'm sorry. I was going to, and then it didn't work. All right, so this is Doan. As you can tell, I'm Doan. Doan. Sorry. Um, my notes are loading. So, uh, well, I guess I could start. You can do it. I can do it without my notes. So I'm sorry if I'm going to ramble on a little bit. Uh, so in an experiment, first you got to ask a question, right? And usually you ask a question when you observe stuff. So we go out to the field and observe nature, because that's what we're trying to study, right? We want to know more about nature. So what we do um, is that we go out to like parks, reserves. You can also go to forest park, like local parks, like Tower Grove as well. Um, and we look for plants, um, and we look for insects as well, because insects live on plants usually. So if you find a plant that you're interested in, then you um, can find in, uh, you can find an insect that you're interested in as well. So with our insects, we have to look for uh, Telia trifoliata or wafer ash. Um, most people know it as wafer ash, I think. And so we go and look for those, and then we when we find one, we like look at it, and then we're like, mm, is there insects on there? No, and then you move on to the next plant. Is there insects on there? No. Uh, we haven't found a really dense population of our insects, so it's kind of hard. So one of the main things um, that is important to our lab is our, our, our outreach. And so if you find some of these insects in your backyard or in a park nearby your house, that would be great. Um, I'm hoping that you guys can tell us where we can find these little guys. So uh, what we're really interested in our lab, or I'm interested in, is the environmental effects on animal behavior. So one of the most important environmental effects, because it also affects us, is temperature, right? So what we do is we go and survey temperature on these different uh, plants, and we use temperature guns like these. So don't point these at your eyes. It's going to burn. So we um, point it at something and it tells you what temperature it is. So it's a pretty nifty <coughs> equipment. Um, and it's not expensive at all. It's like $15 or something. Uh, right, so when we go and survey temperature, we take notes and we test those temperatures in the lab. So it's more controlled than just being outside and getting bit by mosquitoes all the time. Uh, so we go to our lab observation. And so, as Casey said, we grow, green, uh, we grow our plants in a greenhouse, 
and we put insects on them and we net them and we take care of them. And when it's time, we take them into our lab and uh, the, my specific project look at temperature, so I use a uh, incubator to manipulate our temperature. And what I'm, look, and what I'm more, most interested in is the temperature effects on mating calls. So how does temperature um, change or does it keep the same or, I don't know, or do they not like to call it certain temperatures or do they like to call it these certain temperatures? Um, let's see if my notes are up because I forgot where I am. And so what we found so far um, is pretty cool because we have these uh, insects calling in our lab and we kind of measure different traits of their signals or their calls. And so what we found is that, um, does anyone know what the pitch is, right? So like lower pitch, like deep voice, and higher pitch, like um, kind of like a soprano, right? So what we found is that at higher temperatures, uh, these insects are calling at higher pitch, and then at lower temperatures, they're calling at lower pitch. And then it's kind of like a gradient of pitch across the um, gradient of temperature. So I also have a game for you. It's not as, it's not as interesting, I guess, as uh, Casey's game. But I want you to guess if it's the same species of tree hopper or not. So I'm going to play you a few sounds. Hoping mine works as well. No. So that's one. All right. Okay, so do you want me to play it again, the first and the second one? No? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so the first one is. And the second one is. Still pretty loud. That's a really loud one. Okay, so are they the same species or not? Yes. Yes. No. 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 Who says yes? And who says no? All right, well, that's not the whole room. <laughs> All right, so this is one of the tree hoppers. So this is the wafer ash tree hopper that we study. And then this is another tree hopper that looks the same, but it's a different species and live in another plant. Um, this is Viburnum lentago. I'm not sure what the common name is for that. Um, so those are two different species, but they don't look the same. So these species actually um, find the same species of, as them by listening to these sounds, their mating calls. So they don't want to mate with a different species, so they have, these are called um, species-specific mating calls. All right, so the next one. So this is all in reference to this one, the first one, okay? So the third one, is this the same species as the first one? It plays. Let it load. All right, one more time. And this one's the first one again. I'll play for you. Is that the same or different? Who says the same? Who says it's not the same? Let's see. It's the same. Isn't that really interesting? Like it sounds different to us, but it's the, it's the same species, and they all they still get together. So this is actually at a really high temperature, around 36 degrees Celsius. So it's about 90 90 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And then this guy over here, it was at um, 27 degrees. So that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you can see, you can tell the diff, you can tell the difference that it's, it sounds really different, but it's the same species, and they still mate. So that's really interesting. How about this one? Let it load. <laughs> she doesn't want to play anymore. <laughs> All 
All right, here's the first one again. Is that the same or different? Same. Who's saying? Who says it's different? It's a different one. <laughs> so, this, does anyone know what plant this is? It's really, really pretty in the spring. It's pink. It's red bud. Oh, I'm sorry. It's red bud. So, red bud actually has a, I think it's one of the lower, lower pitch of the species. Um, all right, one last one, then I'm almost done. Okay, is that the same as this one? No. Who says the same? No. Who says it's different? It's the same. <laughs> no one <laughs> can never get it right. Um, okay, so these three are the same, but they sound completely different um, because they're in different temperatures. So this one is at a higher temperature, this one's around the middle, and this one's colder temperatures, um, like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes? Why are your pictures the same? Because they look the same. Oh, they're they actually, the yes, so there's this thing called the species complex, where, um, and also called cryptic species, where they look the same, but they don't mate. Um, they, they rarely interact with each other, and they live on different plants. So they're considered different species because they don't interbreed. Don't ask me what a species is, because that's still over in debate with everyone else. Yes? Are the different species of tree hoppers specific to different plants? Yes, they're very um, host specific. Um, they like to lay their eggs on their host plant. And usually it's their natal plant, it's where they're born. Usually they're, they like to stay on their natal plant and then mate there and then lay eggs. But if it dies, then I guess they leave. Um, are there other questions? Yes. In my wildflower and garden book from Botanical Garden, <laughs> Katie did only sing if the temperature is above 50 degrees. Ah, yes. Well, that's interesting. I don't think they're very picky on... Archery uppers are not that picky with temperature. They just like to look for mates. Um, but they do sound the same. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes? Um, they usually kind of jump ship before it dies and they are not left with food. Um, they are uh, usually in a cluster of plants, so they have choices of where to go. Yes? Um, so the different temperature, um, different temperature means different sound? Yes, that's right. Different temperature means different sounds. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on. Oh, one more, sorry. Who was it? Yes. So, oh yeah. So, can, so are there different, there are different species? Um, does it mean that they, like, um, there's like a row of three hoppers? Does it mean that it can only stay on that plane and then like be on the same species or can it be grow on other plants? Uh, so, so like if they're on a red bud, would they go on a wafer ash plant? Yeah. Um, no because their nutrition is different. So um, wafer ash is actually, does uh, make secondary compounds to deter herbivores so, it's, so that the insects stop eating them. So only th these specific tree hoppers can actually eat them. So if they grow up in red bud, they don't have that um, adaptation for this plant. Does that make sense? Cool, okay. All right, next, so. Other than mating, obviously most animals are also um, trying to survive and avoid predators like this jumping spider. I don't know if you can see it, but this brown thing right here is that tree hopper, is the tree hopper that we study. Um, and then this is a common northern North American jumping spider that we found in a greenhouse. So yeah, <laughs> is there? Jackpot. It's jackpot, yeah. And so, 
other than calling, they actually also have other behaviors like jumping or falling off the tree. And we, like, we wanted to capture that and see how that looked like because it's usually they're really, really small and you can't see them. Um, and they're kind of fast. So we have this on high speed video camera, which is going to be in slow mo. Oh, shoot. It cannot play. That's really sad. It's not playing. Can I connect it to my computer, you think? No, I don't, don't disconnect it. Okay, I won't disconnect anything. Well, if you want to look at it later, I'll show you. I have it on my laptop. Um, so I had two videos of that, but it's kind of funny because they like, they're not very good flyers because their pronotum is really big and it's kind of, it's uneven. Um, and so they, one of them goes backflip and then tries to kind of like fly and try to get its, uh, <laughs> try to get its balance. And then another one is the, this one just falls. He lets go and falls and then tries to like kind of backstroke through the air to try and get its balance. But anyway, I have that in my laptop and I will show you if you want to. So if you see any of them like these, so these are egg masses. So when they're ready to lay their eggs, they lay it on the stem of the plant and then they cover them with this waxy coating. Um, we're not sure what it really does, but we hypothesize that they, like, they cover them to protect the eggs from overwintering and from predators from eating them. Um, but if you see, they kind of look like scale bugs too, so sometimes people think they're scale bugs. We, I don't know. Um, so if you see them like this uh, in your backyard or anywhere you go, let me know. We are looking for new populations. Okay, so as you can see, they look like thorns, and as um, Casey has mentioned, there's not a lot of studies on these guys. Um, but a lot of them have been, a lot of other tree offers have been studied, like these four. So this one right here, they're in the same family. This one looks like an ant, and this one looks like a wasp. So that's what we call um, ant mimicry or wasp mimicry. So they copy. Um, they copy really mean insects to prevent other insects from killing them. And there's also camouflage. So this one, from far, it's going to look like a dead branch. And then this one is really, really big thorns. So these are all in the same tree hoppers. Yes? You know what? Pictures make them look big. How big are these bugs? That's true. That It you does know, make them look big. Like, like Half a centimeter. <laughs> Half a centimeter. Okay. They're like, so like... Yeah. Oh, so this is yeah, so they literally look like little thorns <coughs> on the plant. Um, yeah, so we don't really have, you can't, you won't be able to see much of these um, interesting looking tree hoppers here in Missouri because most of them are tropical. Um, but if you look hard enough in your plants and you look and you pay attention to more things in the forest, maybe you'll look, find something interesting and then you'll let us know, right? Right. Okay, cool. I'll take any questions, I guess. Do you want questions or do you want like at the end? Okay, cool. Thank you. You made it into two. So, they worked on that one. Um, how do I exit? <laughs> There you go. All right, so my name is Noah. Uh, I'm entering my junior year at St. Louis University, so I'm about halfway done with my undergrad. Um, and I started working with Casey and Dylan uh, last fall. Um, what I'm really interested in is the different mating behaviors and courtship behaviors of the tree hopper that we study, and the scientific name is called Ancanopa venetata. Um, so these are some of my females over here. Uh, and you can tell they're a female because they have a really long pronotum um, compared to the males. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of the male on the next slide. 
But some really big ideas that I uh, want to talk about in relation to what I am interested in uh, are how these two things affect different animal behaviors. So how context and environment affect behaviors. Um, so on the left, this is kind of the context that I look at uh, some of the behaviors that I see in tree hoppers. Um, and this is mating. So this is actually two tree hoppers mating. Um, this one on the left is a male, and this one on the right is a female. So the male is a, a little bit smaller than the female, and his pronotum is a little bit shorter. And we, in the lab, we paint the pronotum of uh, each individual just so we can keep track of them and we know which one is which. Um, and then for the environment, uh, I, just like Dylan, uh, want to look at how temperature can affect these different mating behaviors. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate this, uh, I wanted to look at a behavior that we do, and that's uh, hugs. And I really like chimpanzees, that's why I uh, put a picture of some chimps hugging on there. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys, what are some different circumstances where you would hug somebody? Um, yes? Yeah, because you, you love your friends and you really want to express that emotion that you love them, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. When somebody's being nice to you, so whenever you are grateful for something, uh, you'll hug somebody. Um, on my best friend's birthday. Yeah, so to congratulate somebody whenever it's their birthday. Um, what about... Uh, when you're apologizing to somebody, I know like whenever I had to hug my parents when I was little, that was like the main reason I was hugging them. <laughs> I do a lot of that. Um, so what about uh, some different environments where that would change whether or not you're going to hug them? Uh, do you guys have any other sort of circumstances where you maybe wouldn't hug somebody, even if you wanted to portray uh, congratulations or I'm sorry or I love you, but you wouldn't hug them? Yeah? At school, exactly. So whenever I was in middle school and I was like saying goodbye to my parents, uh, but all my friends were around me, I definitely did not want to hug my parents. I was way too embarrassed to do that. Um, yes. Excellent. Um, so these are just two really cool uh, examples of how temp I mean how the environment and how the context that you're in can affect. Uh, how you behave. Um, so another example I have in the insect world, uh, it's a bee behavior because they're bees. Um, oh, and it's called the waggle dance. So bees do this really cool thing. It's, uh, it's a part of foraging behavior. So whenever they go out and they look for food, um, they do this dance and it helps orient them using the sun um, to where their hive is um, so that whenever they go out they can uh, figure out how to get back home. So this foraging behavior, um, would you expect this behavior to be very important in the context of mating, maybe? Would you expect that? Not so much mating as when they're looking for food, they can tell and tell the rest of the hive to head north, south, mm -hmm. east, west. So they do that little wagging dance to show directions. Right. For a, a lot of them. Right. For their food. Mm -hmm. For one thing. Yeah, it's, it's really useful to find food, but um, maybe in the context of mating, it's not going to be so useful, or it's just not going to be important to play that same kind of role. Um, so what I want to look at when I look at mating is I just, first off, I really just want to describe some of the different behaviors that I see, because nobody has really looked at all of these different really cool uh, communicative behaviors that... Um, our tree hoppers are doing. And I would also like to investigate how temperature affects those behaviors. And that's how that environment kind of plays in there. Um, and ultimately, I'd like to see if there's some sort of standard uh, unifying pattern that most of these tree hoppers exhibit. And maybe how does temperature and the context that they're in affect that uh, unifying pattern? Oh, and this is just my setup. So whenever I'm in the lab, I've got a little incubator there and my plants. This is my listening device, um, and I'm recording them with a the video, and I'm listening to them. These is actually, I can see uh, the different sounds that they make on my computer. So some of the courtship behaviors that I see um, 
are right here. And some of them are vibrational, like uh, the male and female signals, uh, the male purring, the female clucking. Those are going to be those vibrations that we hear. Uh, but some of them could be visual, like maybe the shaking or the swaying. Or the swaying also could be tactile, so they're touching each other and they're communicating with touch. Um, or maybe some of them are both. Uh, it's really fun and cool because we don't really know, and it's, it's really cool to try to figure that out. So I just want to go in and explain to you what some of these different behaviors are. So the male and female signals, uh, you heard Casey and Dylan playing some of them earlier. Um, so when they duet, it's a male and a female call and they're right next to each other. Um, and what we call about is whenever you have these signals in a long series. So you have one right after the other. Um, and I'll actually play this for you so you can hear it again. So what you're hearing is the, uh, oh, that's the male, and then the female likes it, so she goes, mmm, like this is earlier. So right here, uh, it's just kind of a visual representation. Um, so you've got this long male call, and then right after, you've got the short female call. Um, so what's really cool is uh, sometimes the males are calling first and the females are responding, and sometimes the females are calling first and the males are responding. And there's certain qualities about these calls that are preferred by both the males and the females. So it's actually both individuals finding each other attractive uh, whenever they decide to mate. So another uh, cool behavior that I noticed whenever I was in the lab uh, is this shaking that the males will do. Um, so he'll actually stand up on his legs and just kind of shake. And that video is a little bit slower than it is in real life. Um, but this is, it could be some sort of uh, visual interaction um, but it also has this really cool vibrational noise that goes along with it. And something that I find really interesting about this is that uh, if you look at the structure of the vibration that they do, this is that male call that I showed you before. Um, so it's got this long signal right in the front of it and then it has three short pulses right at the end. And whenever you look at the visual representation of the shaking, uh, you have that same thing. So it's this really long signal and then a bunch of pulses after it. Uh, and I think that's really interesting because uh, maybe because they're both a part of the mating context, they have a similar importance um, in that context. Or maybe it's just some sort of uh, in internalized structure because uh, of the vibrational organs that they have, they just have to produce sound in this structure. But I don't really know, and it's really cool to try to figure that out. Another thing that I, I noticed whenever the males would walk um, is that sometimes they started making this purring noise. Um, and it was only whenever they were like really interested uh, in the female and they were really just about to mate. Um, so this one's a little bit harder to hear. So it sounds like a little bit of oscillating. To me, it sounds like a cat purring, but I just really like cats. Yeah, so it's, uh, it sounds like a cat to me. And I, maybe I just really like cats, so I just think about cats a lot. But, um, <laughs> but I'm not really sure how this plays a role in mating, but I know that the males do it all the time whenever they're mating, and they don't do it whenever they're not. Um, so it would be interesting to try to figure that out. Another really cool thing is that the females, once the, the males kind of uh, get, they will grab onto the females and they'll sit there for a while before they start mating. And sometimes the females will kind of sway back and forth. They'll, they'll keel around like a sailboat and their big pronotum looks like a sail. Um, so we call this swaying. And it's a little bit slow, but you can kind of see it there. Uh, but what's really cool is they started making this clucking noise. So whenever I was looking at a different species of tree hopper, um, they look a little bit different. Um, they would make this, what I think is a, dis is a distress call, because sometimes whenever I would end up kind of poking them with uh, a probe or something in the lab, or if they were stuck in like a little water droplet, they would start making this clucking noise. Uh, so I think it's really interesting that the females are doing it here, but maybe in a different context, um, that behavior plays a different role, and it's a little bit important in a different way. 
So I'll play that clucking for you to hear it. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like a little like a uh, duck or a chicken or something clucking, but I've only heard the females do it, so it's, it's really interesting. And then the last thing uh, is I just really want to look how, how temperature affects all these different things. So what you can see there uh, in that little gif is the male, uh, whenever he starts to mate, he'll, he'll shoot his wings open, and it's a little bit in slow motion right now. Um, but he'll shoot his wings open, and then they start mating, and they actually, they'll turn away from each other. Um, but I would like to see how temperature affects all these sorts of behaviors. So maybe it affects how likely it is that they're going to uh, copulate or mate. Or maybe it, uh, it affects how often the male tries to do this, because sometimes it takes multiple times. Uh, or maybe it affects like how often a male calls or how often a female calls. Or really any other behavior, I think it'd be really cool uh, to figure out how temperature affects this and what role they play in the context of me. Can I answer that question? Oh, oh just a question. Yes. I know it's probably already been said, but when they, when they do their fucking sounds or, or their crying sounds, is that their feet are part of the plant or is that part, or that part of the body? Um, so we, we don't really know. Uh, <laughs> I know that, yeah, uh, it'd be really cool to figure it out. Uh, I've tried to get some really close up videos to kind of see what's moving around. Um, whenever they do walk, it sounds a little bit different. Um, and I know that sometimes the males will stay in one place and then start walking, and the purring sounds the same the whole time. So it really doesn't like matter if they're walking or not. Uh, it must be some other part of their body that's doing it. But we really don't know a lot about it. How long do these guys live? One year. One year, yeah. Like yeah. an entire winter over? They overwinter as eggs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have, we've got one more little mini presentation, and I know we're running up close to time, so. Hi, guys. Thanks for staying around. Thanks, Noah. I'm going to talk a little bit different than what you guys have been hearing. So as Casey mentioned, I just got here a few weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. And so I don't have a lot of stuff with the tree hopper. So I want to talk about what I was doing before then, uh, before I got here at the University of Florida. All right. So most of the animals that we think about on an everyday basis have males and females, right? And this can lead to some really cool stuff, right? So like these beetles. You have these males with these really big horns, and you see the female walking in front, and the males will use these horns to fight with each other and throw each other off trees, you know, to fight. Um, you also get cool behaviors. You maybe have seen this before in birds, where the males are really colorful and dancing around and trying to attract the females. And so having males and females, uh, having separate sexes, as what we think of with most animals, can lead to all sorts of cool stuff, right? But a lot of animals don't have separate sexes. So who can tell me what the term hermaphrodite means? In, in your oceanography, whatever, there is a seahorse that can have the female takes her eggs and puts it into the male. Yeah, so they have separate sexes. They just do it a little differently than we're used to. But a lot of animals, a surprisingly large number of animals, are what are called simultaneous hermaphrodites which means they're both male and female at the same time. Um, and it's been estimated that five to 6% of all animals may be simultaneous hermaphrodites. So it's not uncommon. And there can be some really good things about being a simultaneous hermaphrodite. I mean, we're not used to it, right? But these animals have some big advantages. And one, one of the big advantages that they might have is that they can have offspring, they can have kids without having to meet another individual, right? So if you're floating along in the ocean and you don't, for whatever reason, you don't meet up with another member of your own species, you can still make offspring because you're a simultaneous hermaphrodite, because you have both eggs and sperm to make offspring. But there can be some pretty bad disadvantages to being a simultaneous hermaphrodite, or at least to uh, have self-fertile <laughs> So there's something called inbreeding depression, and this is where your offspring are too closely related to each other that you can have all sorts of bad things going on. So there's a famous case 
um, with the, the Habsburg dynasty in Spain, where you can see they had a lot of like uncles marrying nieces, and second cousins married, first cousins, brothers, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And the dynasty eventually ended, and this Charles II of Spain, who had a lot of genetic deformities, probably because of all this inbreeding depression. And so it can be a bad thing to be, have your offspring be too closely related to you. So they're good things and bad things. Um, and what I was studying when I was at Florida is this animal called a tenophore. So a tenophore is a marine gelatinous animal. It's kind of like a jellyfish, except it can't sting you. It has these really cool comb rows um, that use cilia to flap along and it diffracts light. So you get these really cool rainbow patterns. And not very much is known about these animals, but they're a really cool thing to study because we believe that they are the, the animal, the currently existing animal, that's the furthest related away from humans of all other animals. And so by studying these guys, we may be able to get to a sense of what like early animals maybe looked like or what sort of behaviors they had. And these guys are also simultaneous hermaphrodites. And so we could ask really cool, interesting, reproductive questions about what's going on with these guys. So one of the first things we wanted to test is whether they had inbreeding depression if they were able to self-fertilize. And so we set this up very simply. We put one of these guys in a bowl to spawn overnight. So you leave them in a bowl by themselves. The next day they'll have kids. Um, presumably if you leave them by themselves, they're having kids with themselves. Um, or we put two together in a bowl. And the idea there is that when there's another, they can have offspring with the other member. So they can also what's called outcross rather than have inbreeding. And so we set this up, we did it a bunch of times, and then we looked at uh, whether we had higher survivorship of the offspring in one of these conditions versus the other. And what we found is that in these guys where they had were mating by themselves, having offspring by themselves, they had lower offspring survivability or viability, which was an indication that there was inbreeding depression going on when they self-fertilized. So this was pretty cool, it was the first indication that there may be inbreeding depression in these guys. Um, but we saw that a really weird result also happen. So remember, we had two in a bowl and we had one in a bowl. So what would you expect for the number of eggs in each of those bowls? Anyone? You're, you'd expect twice as, well, 45 sometimes you had. Uh, you'd expect twice as many eggs in the bowl where there tw when there are two guys than when there's one guy, right? You'd expect two times as many eggs. But we didn't see that at all. We, in fact, don't worry about the stats or anything. We, in fact, found that they were the same number of eggs when you had one by itself versus when you had two by itself. And so we were trying to figure out what could have done that. Why would you have twice as or the same number of eggs with two versus one? And we came up with this kind of wacky idea that's been talked about in some animals called gamete trading. Um, so this has been shown in a few simultaneous hermaphrodites. And what they'll do, instead of putting out both eggs and sperm, when there's another individual there, they will trade with each other. One of them will say, I'm going to put out the eggs. The other said, I'll put out the sperm. And so they can make sure that they're not self-fertilizing. Um, this has been shown in some snails. It's been shown in some worms. But it's a pretty rare thing. And there's been uh, no indication that tenophores maybe have this ability. In fact, what do you need to be able to do this? What is a very basic thing, sort of what they've been talking about, that you need to have before you can have this system go on? Communication. Communication, the perfect word I was looking for. But there's been no evidence ever that any species of tenophore can communicate with another individual of its species that we know of. So this is a pretty wacky idea, but we thought, what the, he what the heck? We'll give it a shot and test it out, see what happens. So how, how would you test whether something like this is going on? Well, what we did was develop what we call tennis courts, quote unquote tennis courts, where we had these little aquaria and we made two types of aquaria. We had a little barrier in between and with one of them we had a barrier that had holes in it and we put an individual on each side. The idea then is that they could pass what, through chemical communication, which is a very common thing, especially in marine. All sorts of animals use chemical communication. When there are little holes there, they will have, be able to sense that there's another individual through chemical communication there. And then we had these uh, arenas, these tennis courts, with a completely sealed barrier. So we put them in on each side. They had no idea that there was another individual near them. 
and the other side of the barrier. We let them spawn overnight, which means have offspring overnight like they normally would do. And then the next day we counted the number of eggs on each side of the barrier. So what you would expect, and don't get too thrown off by the details here. So we did these statistics to test after we did it. But what you would expect, the general idea is, if you find a result over on this side of this distribution, that means that they are putting out, the, on each side of the little tennis courts, they are putting out a very similar number of eggs. So like each of them put out 50 or something like that, which would be the opposite of what you'd expect if there was egg trading or gamete trading going on. If there was egg trading or gamete trading, you would expect a result way over on this side, which means that one side put out a whole bunch of eggs and one side put out very few eggs. And that's what you would expect to see if they had some communication happening. And if something fell out in the middle, that means they're just randomly putting out some number of eggs and we can't really figure out what's going on. And so what did we find? Well, when you have a sealed barrier, when they don't know that there's another individual there, we found they were putting out very similar numbers of eggs to each other. This isn't surprising because we made sure they were about the same size of, as each other, and uh, the number of eggs they put out is really highly dependent on the, how big they are. But when we had a barrier with holes in it, we got a result over here showing that they were putting out very different numbers of eggs. So this is, a, a, to us, was a pretty surprising result, <laughs> right? So this was, uh, in our minds, pretty clear evidence that something is going on with these guys, that they have the ability to recognize that another individual is around them when they're spawning and change how many eggs they are putting out when they're spawning. And so this is the first evidence that communications in tenophores, which is a whole group of, of animal, um, and we think that they're probably using chemical communication, sending out stuff through the water, but we need to test and figure out what exactly that chemical would be before we can do that, before we can say for sure. And with that, have any questions or any questions for everybody? And there's some stuff set up for people to mess with if we have time. Thanks. Yeah. Well, so all of their offspring are self-fertilized. You can still have a little bit of genetic variability because they're crossing over in various mechanisms, but they're all completely related to the individual. But they're not basically the same except for some. Well, there'll, there'll be some difference. So they're not they're not clones, okay. but they're 100% related. If that makes any sense. I mean, they get all the individuals that the, the mother had, but because you have crossing over and various things when you're making eggs and sperm, you don't necessarily have the same alleles if you want to get like a technical term about it. I don't know if we have one question. Yeah. Well, ah, so that's a good question. I didn't show you, but so I was, I was in Florida, so I am sorry to break the news, but if you look for them here in Missouri, you're not going to find them. Um, but they live in the ocean, but we had a little broom, it's a very sophisticated method. We had a broom handle with a beaker attached to the end of it, and we looked for them and we just scooped them up when we found them. All right, thank you guys.